Hello again, my name is Dennis Baker. I'm the Life Raft Program Director. Thank you guys for being in-house. Thank you for everyone that's watching the live stream. Welcome to everyone here. Um, a couple more things before we get started. We are trying to be social media conscious. So we're on things like Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash SAG Foundation, twitter.com slash SAG Foundation. As you know, people in the house, when the email goes out, events fill up fast, right? So sometimes we, um, the events, a lot of times, will be on the website before the email goes out hint, hint, but also sometimes we'll um, send out announcements through Twitter and Facebook saying, hey, sign up before the email goes out. So those are reasons to follow those. The biggest is youtube.com slash SAG Foundation. There, I just counted, we have over four years of archived life raft events alone for everyone to view free. So that's for you as members, that's for non-members. What we need you to do is not only watch, but share. We are a small nonprofit, and there's still so many actors that don't know about us. And the way that we get found out by actors is by you telling your friends. Because if you tell 10 friends, that then tell 10 friends, you see where it goes. So we need your help to do that. Um, this event will be up. Go check it out if you missed anything. But then again, please leave a comment, share as you see fit, and we much appreciate that. We have a wonderful evening. As I mentioned before, this is one of an actual five-part series. We're doing independent um, producing series. We're doing distribution, and we're doing financing in New York. We're going to do that event there. We're going to do pre-production today, and then we're going to do um, production and post-production, and then all those events will go online to the YouTube page for everyone to see to get a five-part series of information about indie producing. So please share that word out so people can go check it out if they missed an event or couldn't even see all of them. They can see it there. So I want to introduce our moderator. She is a wonderful woman from Film Independent who's been so helpful because she is the producer of residence over there. Her name is Kelly Thomas. Give her a hand. Hello, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's really exciting to be here. Um, this is my second time with Life Raft, and it was a great experience, so I'm happy to be doing it again. Um, I am the Film Independent Producer in Residence. Film Independent is the organization that produces the LA Film Festival and the Independent Spirit Awards, which will be happening in the rain on the beach this Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> but you can watch comfortably from your televised, <laughs> from the televised perspective. Um, we also have uh, the LA Film Festival and we do workshops year round. So one of my roles there is to um, uh, curate, to choose people to be, to participate in and to design the curriculum for workshops for writers, directors, producers, documentarians. We also produce a financing conference in conjunction with the LA Film Festival in June. So if you want to check any of that out, go to our website, filmindependent.org. My background is as an independent producer. I still actively produce. I have a feature in post right now. It's called Sharon123. It's very exciting. Um, I also did some branded entertainment for Lincoln Motors and Vanity Fair last summer, and those are online as well. So um, if the world is changing. We have to catch up to it. <laughs> and the, the modes of distribution are many. So, um, But that's once you get it in the can. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about what to do when somebody gives you an amazing script or maybe you wrote it yourself. Um, so I'm going to introduce these uh, panelists who are my fellow producers and have them give a little bit of their background and we'll start down that road. So first we have Kevin Comer, Susan Diner, and Frederick Thornton. Hi, I'm, I'm Kevin, and uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I have a background in uh, all the way through from production, so I, I came up as a PA and just worked my way all the way up to producing, so I'm pretty well versed in what happens on set and stuff. And uh, I have a couple independent films uh, that came out this past year, one's with uh, um, Frank Langella, another one with Michelle Monaghan. Um, produced a number of short films, commercials, and I have a TV show that's coming out on HBO next uh, March. It's called Doll and M with Emily Mortimer. I'm Susan Diner. Hello. Thank you guys for coming. Um, my background is a little bit different. I started off uh, working in the studio world. Um, I worked for Richard Donner 
uh, then worked my way up, worked for Wolfgang Peterson in development, uh, got a job working for Charlie Sheen and Nick Cassavetes as their VP, um, had another job at the studio level. We had to deal with Sony with uh, Prairie Fire Films, and then left and went backwards and decided to do independent film. <laughs> so uh, I have a friend that um, we decided we wanted to work together, my friend from my Redskins bar. And he's more of the line producer type. So we teamed up. Um, we found a, a script for Brick. And that took us three and a half years to make. Um, we did that. That came out, um, premiered at Sundance. And I directed and produced a documentary called Punk's Not Dead about punk rock. And uh, then produced a documentary called After Porn Ends about if you could lead a normal life after you've left the porn industry. Um, which, surprisingly, some people can. <laughs> and then uh, I just produced a movie called Free Ride, starring Anna Paquin, Cam Gigande, Dre Matteo, which just came out last month, um, and it's available on demand um, for anybody who wants to watch it. And uh, gearing up to direct and produce a comedy called Blank Nation, and got, have a bunch of other projects in development. Oh, I have to follow that, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Frederick Thornton. I'm 27. I got into producing. I met my friend at a party and asked me if I wanted to produce his film, so <laughs> that worked out pretty well, I think. I made a film called Little Rock in 2009. That was my first feature length film. Went on to win a couple of awards there. I've produced seven features total so far. I've got two features coming out this year one named Lake Los Angeles and another named Suburbanite. And I don't really have. I have, I've had Stephen Tobolowsky in one of my films, so I guess that's, <laughs> that's what I've got. So, but uh, I know Aza, he worked, I yeah, he worked at CESA, and I worked with him at CESA there, which is California State Summer School for the Arts, so I know him, he's a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I liked After Porn, so that's a really good, sh you should actually, guys, you really check it out, it's actually a really interesting documentary. Thank you, I paid him. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well thank you guys again, and I'll go back to that burning question, what do you do? So pre-production, which, um, you know, that, that can be defined loosely in a lot of different ways, but, you know, in my mind, it, it really starts, it kind of drifts into development, I think. So um, when someone gives you a script and you say, hey, I really love this, I want to do this, because why else would you do it if it's an independent film? Um, <laughs> So what do you do? What, what jumps into your head? What do you think about? Casting, locations, money, credits? What? Um, I'll start, I guess. Um, for me, it's all about the script. Um, I've been crazy enough to work with two first time, three first-time directors, four if you count me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you have to really, really love the project because everybody's going to say no. Um, you're going to get a zillion doors slammed in your face. So it really is about the script. And I always work with the writers. There's usually several rewrites to be done. Whether or not you think so at the beginning, you'll always dig deeper and find stuff. And, and um, the best kind of writer is the one who takes your notes and then takes it up a level. So they don't necessarily take everything you say, but they listen and they address the issues. Um, and then it's about really finding the money. Um, it's hard to attach cast, although I've done it with my next project, without having the financing in place. Although if you know people, you can usually do that. Or if you have um, lesser known cast, or somebody that you know that you can get to the actor. But um, I think really it starts with the screenplay. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, <clears throat> these, these projects take years to, um, to, to, to go through the, the whole cycle from when you first get the script to like when it actually, when you finish delivering it. So it's like three or you know, four or five years of your life. So you really have to be careful on like what sort of project that, that you wanna take on. And uh, I guess most, most, everyone, most everyone's sort of actors and probably a lot of people here wanna do their own, I'm guessing wanna do their own projects that, you know, that, that showcase them, themselves. So that's a good start that you know you wanna do something that you're gonna be in. Um, so, the, so the script absolutely is 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 the biggest thing. Um, once once you have the script, I mean, um, like when you start to get, you know, like once you get past like the script and the money and get into the actual pre-production aspect of it, uh, pre-production is probably the most important and underutilized time 
Um, we can probably talk about it a little bit more as we get into pre-pro, like what exactly happens. But you know, the more time you spend in pre-pro, the better your shoot's going to be because you only have a you know a very limited time, like when you're in production, and it is pretty much you're almost preparing for like a you know guerrilla warfare. So you just, you have to spend as much time as possible in pre-pro just to figure everything out, and, and you know, and, and uh, you don't want to shorten that time because it's the inexpensive money. Because like once you get on set and like once you know all the crews there and the gears there, you know, money is, you know, is being burned and you can't really change what you've done in pre-pro. So, you know, I recommend always, always, you know, just give yourself enough time in pre-pro. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment. But um, I guess the only way I'm different is that I usually pre-production, production, post-production post in about a year total um, because these guys have done, their careers are much more successful than mine, so I can't afford to, like, you know, sit around for three or four years. I have to keep moving in order to catch up with these guys. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I usually make films in about a year. Like, uh, I wrapped production on my last feature. Well, one of my last features, I wrapped it in April, and then we got lucky. It got accepted to this grant in Poland, and now we're hoping to premiere it this year, right now. So I know that is not normal. So don't expect everything to come easy, like they were saying. Stay, being in production is, you know, it's a blessing because it gives you time to flesh out everything, you know, starting with the script, like they were saying, take your time, you know, get it right, because once you're shooting, you can't go back. And once you're shooting, if you want to change something, it's going to cost money, it's going to cost time. And you got to remember that it can be a real pain to try and get things changed on the fly. I was just going to add something really quickly. Usually with the independent films, the actual pre-production is about a month maybe five or six weeks if you're super lucky. But what you do have going for you is all the time leading up to pre-production where you can really work on stuff yourself, like work on the shot list if, if you're going to be the director of the film. Work on, you know, your dream actors who you want in the roles and getting them. But, I mean, there's a lot you can do in the time leading up to pre-production to try and prepare for when you actually start. Because when you start, it's like you're shot out of a cannon. Yeah, I, I tend to call that the unpaid pre-production. <laughs> because really, you and two other people are still working on it all the time, but nobody's getting paid. And, you know, for an indie budget, when you start prep, um, you know, when you decide we're officially going to have an office, which may just be my living room, but I'm going to invite people there every day at a certain time. <laughs> or, um, you know, we want to start working with attorneys. We want to start... Uh, bringing on pe people onto the team, that's when, and you have to start paying people, so that's when, you know, the official prep starts. And, you know, I agree with Kevin about uh, budgeting as much as you can because those dollars go so much further than your production dollars. You can sort out so many problems in a well-planned shoot ahead of time. Um, but. It doesn't always happen that way. So, you know, it's just, it's a good rule of thumb. So uh, following that, how would you guys, um, if, if you're getting close to the real pre-production, the paid pre-production, who do you think of as the essential ingredients for your team to put together? Well, I think of, I've been lucky. I've, at this point now, I have a crew that I love working with and I'm going to keep working with. So I immediately think of my DP and I think of my sound guy. Because a lot of guys forget about, a lot of people forget about the sound guy, and they're like, uh-oh, we have no one to do field mixing. And then they're, they're scrambling like, hey, can you do this for like 50 bucks a day? And they're like, no, you're not doing this for 50 bucks a day. So those are two people I think keep in mind. I, and then I think of my uh, co-producers as well. You know, it's, that's a, that, I think that's probably one of the biggest things, is to have people you can trust to be your co-producers. Because if you don't have someone that you can trust, then you're going to get a call from SAG, and they're going to ask you, what are you doing? And Because you're going to thought, well, she was supposed to have taken care of that, or he was supposed to have taken care of that. Next thing you know, this actually happened to me. I got cussed out on set by an actor because I thought one of my co-producers had handled SAG, and it turns out they hadn't. So I was the one that got cussed out for that one. So make sure you have competent co-producers, I'd say. Yeah, I would agree that um, obviously your DP is really important. Your casting director, if you haven't already cast the film, your editor, and I would say you really need to start thinking about post-production in pre-production, um, especially now because there's so many different ways to deliver, but also even marketing. Because now, with 
you know, so many distribution outlets, you need to know your audience. And if you have a special niche, you want to start um, catering to that audience. So I think that's just as important nowadays as finding a distributor. Because if they see that you've got, you know, 500,000 followers on Facebook, I mean, seriously, casting, uh, casting directors, when they talk to the agents and they're negotiating what placement you're going to get in the, in the film, they'll say, well, you know, my client has five million Facebook followers or five million Twitter followers. And you're like, okay, so that means they get an and or a with. <laughs> but it really does matter. So I, I just think um, you really need to start, you, you need to game plan up front about what your film looks like when it's completed and what you're gonna do with it. Um, and your keys, like production designer, um, you know, costumes. And yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I think DP is pretty critical. Um, <clears throat> because the DP is going to figure out like what camera you're going to shoot on, and then like once like once you kind of figure out like what camera you can actually get, um, then then I, and Susan brings up a great point is, you know, figuring out figuring out like how you're going to to, to finish because so many decisions are made. You know, so now since we're in the, in the digital era, you know, like you know how like how are you going to just finish on a hard drive? You're going to you know like what's what what are you going to finish to to make it deliverable to whoever's going to you know hopefully pick up the film. And uh, so that's just so the DP and the editor are the, sort of the biggest, you know, creators um, that, that you really need to bring on. And then for like, once you start to move into to, to the actual pre-production, I mean, I, I bring on the uh, production designer really early because <clears throat> the, the production designer essentially sees, you know, everything that you see on the screen, the production designer is the one who's, you know, painting that palette in a, in a sense. And uh, a lot of times, you know, people will just go for go for locations and just you know kind of do locations on their own, mm -hmm. but it helps out so much more if you get the production designer to be the one who figures out the locations. You know, because one they'll help with like the monetary value, but two they'll help out with the aesthetic, and and that way your whole team is really you know in place um, with you know like with the director, the DP, and the production designer, really just getting getting the look of the movie you know figured out before you even bring on everybody else. I just want to add one more thing about the DP. Uh, it doesn't matter what camera you're shooting on at a, up to a certain point. It matters who's holding the camera, who's working the camera. So I mean, you can have this this beautiful landscape, this beautiful location shot on Alexa, but if it's out of focus or <laughs> or if it's not, you know, if it's overexposed, I mean, you've wasted money, you've wasted your time, and you've wasted your shot in that day. So. And one more thing is usually like the DP will bring their camera people with them. They have their people that they like to work with. So, I mean, that's what I've found in the past. Um, people generally tend to bring their own teams. A production designer will bring their team. So you don't have to worry as much about that once you find your key people. And uh, some, some things that I've made mistakes on in the past is I've, I've chosen unwisely with uh, my DP because um, they had a camera that was free. So I'm like, so oh, I'll go with that DP. They're great. He has his camera out to pay a thing, and then the footage was problematic. You know, they didn't. They, they were. There was like one guy was like on a short film that I did was an AC, and he was a really good AC, but he just had no idea how to light. He had no idea how to move the camera. He had no idea because like I mean, like when like when you're when you're actually you know doing your shots, you know you have to like allow the actors to like leave the frame, say like an editing point. But this DP, he sent to me, well, quote unquote DP, this first day C <laughs> with the free camera, you know, he would he would always chase the 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 the, the actor out of the scene, and it was like this jerky thing. He just he couldn't help himself. So I actually had to get the director on him on like one walkie, and like on one channel, and she would just like was like a Nazi, and she was like yelling at the guy, just like you know, stop, don't move the camera. So so don't choose the that DP. Was me. By, <laughs> don't choose a DP by the camera package they have because you can always find a camera from somebody, you know, and you can always get an inexpensive camera. Um, it's, and, and like, like you were saying, just, you know, get, get the right people. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I have my own horror stories with that. Um, yeah, free cameras are not necessarily free. <laughs> Um, when you add it all up in post and lost time and m misery. Um, so I want to go back to something that Frederick mentioned about the co-producers dealing with things. And you, you mentioned SAG, so I know we have the guilds and the unions and all of that, but what are all these pesky little tasks that have to be handled and have to be handled correctly in prep? And 
what's your kind of triage list of where to start, what has to be done, what you would like to do, and who handles it? I mean, this is how I think of SAG. Like, a lot of, my, a lot of producers get very annoyed with SAG, but here's the thing. SAG's protecting their people, and they do a thing that's, you know, that has to be done. Because otherwise, a lot of, I'm sure they know, there's a lot of shady producers out there, and I'm sure a lot of you people knew already. Hey, I'm going to pay you 100 bucks a day. Come on down. You never get that money. Hey, uh, yeah, it's only like five miles away from your house. It's 30 miles away from your house, and they're not giving you gas money all of a sudden. So that's what I understand. I, I actually enjoy SAG because I understand what they're doing. They're protecting, they're, they're protecting you guys, and that's very important. I, I totally agree. I mean, I've been so fortunate that the actors that really want to work respond to the material, and they're willing to take modified low budget or low budget SAG. And, and um, you know, we're thankful that we have those kind of agreements now that we can use. But back to what you said. I'm more of a creative producer, so I don't deal with all the paperwork like <laughs> these guys do. I usually give it to someone else who does all the paperwork. So Kevin, I know Kevin and I have have uh, we know each other from before, um, so that's why I'm I'm speaking for him here. <laughs> but he he's uh, both of you guys I think can really speak to that better than I can. So she just you know, she's excusing herself out she of the just conversation. Threw it off on us, there. right? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can. So, that, so, but it's the the, the important thing is um, knowing knowing your strengths and, and your weaknesses, and finding people that can complement you, um, because you know there's there's so much to do as a producer that um, you just have to be you know no one can do it all, and uh, you just have to be like you know honest and aware of like what you can handle, and like and then find people who can complement you on that. Um, so, but as far as I to, like, you know, jump into it. I mean, like, I mean, SAG is great in the sense they have for like for they have like all these low budget agreements, and and a lot of times I actually budget by, you know, SAG kind of like determines my budget sometimes <laughs> because it's like like when I'm like doing the budgets, it's like oh I got to be under X amount because I have to, you know, hit this budget you know, line. So that's so it's like you know, it's, and then and then they also have like diversity in casting, so you can actually up, you know, your your budget level and still and still. You know, cover cover yourself. Um, <clears throat> so you know, so if, if you're not, you know, if you're not, a, if you're not a, you know, um, savvy with all this paperwork, definitely find somebody who is who is, and who's really who can really just go through all the all the paperwork because there's just so much that like on the hit list. I mean, you have to you know you have to get the union paperwork, and it takes at least thirty days. You know, because because SAG has like a, you know to pres pr provide that first. You have to get your insurance set up. You have to get your company set up. Um, so there's there's a lot of like hit lists that, that you'll have to go through. Yeah, and um, first of all, I'd like to say a shout out to Drea Clark who handled all my paperwork with SAG for my last film, and also Nicole Arbusto who is my casting director. They're both amazing women. So if you're watching, shout out to you right now. So, um, but seriously, the paperwork, I mean, it's. I guess I dealt with getting, making sure that the dailies were signed, and making sure that their hours, and they took their lunch, and make sure that was all signed in. But all the actual paperwork, uh, Drea handled amazingly. So that's going back to choosing your co-producers. And I couldn't thank that woman more than I can right now. Thank you, Drea. <laughs> I know Drea. She's fantastic. Um, yeah, so you're saying that she helped you with the signatory process. Yes, she was amazing. She was on the phone with SAG every day with any things they needed. I made sure that all our, because I was on set and she was offset. So I make sure that all the paperwork was signed in for that day. I would rush home, scan it in, send it to her, and then she would make sure it got the SAG. And they never shut us down, so that worked out well. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, apart from SAG, there's the Writers Guild, there's the Directors Guild, there's IOTSE, there's Teamsters. It goes on and on and on. Lo uh, locations is part of Teamsters these yeah. days. Um, as our casting directors, yeah, yeah. Casting directors are part of teams, right? so those are all things you have to figure out ahead of time. If you know, if you're going to be signatory to those guilds, those unions, and as Kevin was saying, you definitely plan ahead because it's a minimum of 30 days to to do that paperwork. And, and really, you should be getting it in earlier because I mean, otherwise you're just setting your up. Yeah, so that's happening yeah. during the non-paid. Pre-production. You're just setting yourself period. up for failure if you're like, oh, I got 31 days. I guess I'll do it now. Yeah, completely. I mean, 30 days is like the that's that's what they give you, but I mean, it's, I mean it just takes takes a lot longer. So I mean, just you know, as soon as as soon as you have something ready to go, 
um, you know, definitely get the, get the union paperwork in, start finding out about in insurance, um, start, you know, talk about getting your company set up. There's, there's inexpensive ways to get your, to get a company set up, which I always recommend is to, to, to form, uh, to form an LLC. Um, that way it protects, you know, protects, it protects you, protects, um, the investor, you know, even if it's, if, if it's your uncle, aunt or, or, you know, your Kickstarter or whatever it is, you know, you want, you want to have that, that legal buffer to protect you in case anything goes wrong, but you also have to have that to, um, just, just to get, you know, the, the SAG paperwork done. Um, yeah, because that, that LLC entity, that legal entity is the entity that becomes signatory to all of these other organizations. It's also the entity that will do the finance agreements if you have that, the agreements with producers. So even if I set up an LLC, I have the LLC make a producer's agreement with me, Kelly Thomas. So it's, it's about getting all that paperwork done. Um, and so you, um, I mean, in, as an indie producer, I've, do, I've done a lot of this myself. I have worked with production attorneys too. That's a wonderful, wonderful luxury. Um, and once you work with one, then you have some templates that you can use <laughs> over and over again. Um, but, you know, ideally you have someone who can look over and, you know, that you can negotiate flat deals with people. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We've always negotiated a flat deal for our, um, for our legal, and a lot of times they'll include that. They'll do the LLC for you. Mm -hmm. So if you can take advantage of that and pick a flat fee that works for them, and you'd be surprised. It's not as high as you think. Um, you know, they'll take care of all that stuff for you. And that also reminds me of <clears throat> one important and very difficult position to, to get for independence is a production accountant. Yeah. Um, because, you know, like once, like, once the, like once you get the money in the bank, you know, watching, watching the money during the shoot is, you know, because things happen so fast. And, and, and uh, with, with indie shoots, you know, like you're, you're shooting six day weeks probably, and uh, you know, two, three, you know, three weeks, you know, t you know, and uh, you know, the money is just flying out. So you really need to get somebody early in pre-pro um, who who can set up the, who can set up your budget and set up your system, and then you can watch your cash flow and really manage it well. They don't have to be on set every day um, because you know. I mean, a lot of indie films, you, can't, you just can't afford that. Mm -hmm. But you can find good production accountants who will, you know, like once a week, they will, they'll, they'll like, you know, they'll do the payroll checks, they'll, they'll do, um, you know, they'll write all, all of your, you know, your, your vendor checks and stuff like that. And, and they'll give you a cost report. Um, and, that's, and that's critical to, to have set up in pre-pro. And just to add to that, especially if you're working with a state that does tax incentives, it's really important that you have an accountant because they're going to be working with whomever's the point person at whichever state you're work, you know, you're filming in to make sure that you get your money back <laughs> for those incentives. That brings up a, a good question, actually. At what stage do you think about tax credits and applying for tax credits? Uh, I, for my film that we're working on right now, I'm thinking of it like at the script stage, like when I'm thinking about locations and whatnot. Um, it's unfortunate that filming in Los Angeles is getting to where it is. But in a lot of these states, they just offer you so much to come in and take advantage, I guess. And at a certain, I mean, I, I hate saying it, but a lot of times it's just better to go film out of state. Like when I filmed in Wisconsin, locations in Los Angeles are ridiculously high. In, Los, in Wisconsin, they're like, you want to come film in here? Yeah, come on in. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, the beer is free in the house. Yeah. Or it's 50 cents for a beer. It was like, really? Wait, I went to college there at University of Wisconsin. So I can attest to that. For my student films, like, I had a gun in one of my films that I had to use. And I went to the gun store. I was like, hey, can I, if I give you credit, can I use a gun for my movie? And they're like, sure. Um, here, let me just... Let me just get a piece of paper so you can write down your name. And they left me with a gun and a barrel of bullets. This is, this is before all the shootings. But <laughs> I mean, they're so nice there. And another fellow filmmaker student of mine, they gave him the convenience store overnight. They just gave him the key. Like, go ahead, shoot there. I have a feeling no one's going to just hand me a gun. But, uh, <laughs> but um, another thing about filming in Wisconsin is that 
my friend, my, the director knew the like chief of police or something. And so they're like, yeah, we're going to be filming out in the street. I'm like, really? That's going to work for you? And so we were just filming on the street and the police car rolled by. I was like, hey, what's going on? He's like, you guys filming that movie? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, okay, bye. And they just sped <laughs> off. So like, what, where am I? <laughs> but uh, having said that, you do really need to think about where it's going to be best for you to film. Like my next film, I have several cast members that are on TV series. So I can't go film somewhere else. I have to film in LA um, because there's no way. It just is cost prohibitive to fly them out and fly them back. And you know, it makes no sense whatsoever. And I've got cameos from bands. So I think that makes a difference too. But, but you do really start thinking about it at the script stage. And, and actually, I mean, we, uh, we're just back b before the panel. I mean, like, she was telling me, like, she was just telling me about her film, and and like after after she told me what it was, was about, the very first question I asked was like, where, like, where is it located? Because that's it's it's one of the biggest things right now to to you know it's it's, it's really it's a source of financing, you know. I mean, it's uh, when you when you look at the pie of like, okay, you have to get you know 100% of your money, you know, like what's you know 20% is going to be tax credits. You only have to get 80% now. You know, um. But having said that, like I have, you know, I'm so fortunate that I have these amazing actors who responded to the material, who are getting paid enough money on their TV series that they want to come and work on my little movie for basically, you know, SAG, low budget, or maybe even modified. You know, so that there's an advantage to it as well because people want to sleep in their own bed at night. So yeah, you're not getting that 20, 40 percent tax credit, but you're getting the benefit of having some really incredible talent who wants to work on your movie. So you got to weigh the pros and cons. And also, uh, San Francisco is really film friendly. I found out, like that. I I don't understand like how it, how they let just let you in. They're like, they're, I need to film a scene in your nightclub or your bar. I know I don't have much money. Like, oh yeah, come on in. Just buy beer. Just buy alcohol. And like, they let you in. And it's like really, how in L.A. I would owe like five thousand dollars plus the alcohol tab. Plus, you know, I can't park here. Plus, I can't do that. And I have to make sure that my actors have their own parking spots over here and crew have their parking. Were you non-union in San Fran? Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, because the, the union's pretty tough there. They were really nice to me when I was non-union. <laughs> one other thing about filming in town, I, I did a film in the, in the fall, and, and we stayed in town for four weeks. And we got great cast who worked locally, and they were on TV series too, but also the crew. Mm -hmm. And we did not pay very good rates. You know, we were a tier zero for IOTSI, which is, you know, an average of about $11 an hour for the, you know, like the grip position. And, um, but we were paying their health insurance and we just kind of put the word out that we're nice and this is gonna be fun and you get to stay at home, you get to see your kids and your family and you get insurance and it's only four weeks. <laughs> and then you can go off and do the big things. And we actually, except for finding a production accountant, <laughs> which as you said, is difficult. Um, we actually were very lucky to find people who had that little space and they're like, oh, okay, whatever, I'll do it. Yeah, it'll be fun. And we ended up having a blast. And yeah, and, and, and I, I totally agree with that in the sense that, I mean, LA has, like, I mean, my, just, the, I mean, I've shot all over just doing commercials and stuff. And LA by far is like the best crews and the, the most experienced people. And, and you do get like, you know, much more access to talent here. And uh, so it's, you know, so there, there's a huge advantage to, to, to shooting in, in California, shooting locally. And you can apply for the tax incentive here. Yeah. Yeah. There is one here. It's 20%. Right? Yeah, twenty percent. Kevin's uh, gotten it before. Yeah, I got, I got, I hit the lottery. Um, but it is what it is. It's, it's like hitting the lottery. But if anybody is trying, it starts, I think, in June. Yeah. I, th I, th I think we're gonna do questions via the written, written manner, so. I mean, I just wanted to add on one thing. Since a lot of you guys aren't gonna be, you know, shooting union shoots. There's almost nothing worse for a crew member when they see these Craigslist posts, and I'm sure you've all seen the same Craigslist posts. Don't worry, we'll give you a copy. and We can't pay. At least, it's nice to offer at least gas money on these shoots. Always offer something. Always, you know, offer a lunch or something. At, because you're, that's the, you're gonna get talented crew members, you're gonna get talented cast if you can at least offer gas and to pay for their lunch. Yeah, a well-fed crew is a happy crew. 
Yes. Yeah, without a doubt. That's the one area that I've never skimped on is food. I mean, I've, we've definitely paid people, you know, very, very little on projects, but I've always, always fed them well. Um, because then, because then, 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 then you know that, that, uh, that, that you care about them and that you guys are all in it together and you're all trying to create like, you know, a, a great project together and hopefully grow and, you know, and, and move on to bigger, bigger and better things together. Um, so, you know, giving, giving, you know, getting really good food is, 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 you know, it's a, it's a lifesaver. Absolutely. <laughs> and a coffee truck now and then, if, if, if you can swing it, um, it helps the morale. Um, I had a, one specific question here, which I always, it's always in my list of pre-production things to do, and it takes in more time than I always want it to, which is about clearances. Could you guys speak to that subject? I can speak about music clearances and clip clearances because I did a documentary that had 98 music cues. Yeah, um, which we actually had a clearance person to, to do all that. But in the process, I learned a lot about it, if that's what you're talking about. Um, if, you ca like, if, if you have live music in the film or if you have a song that you know is going to be played in the film and you don't, need to wait until afterwards because I you know if you can wait until post-production to pick all your music not necessarily to pick it all but to try and get the rights to it all I do just because you can you can change stuff in and out and things change when you edit and you change your mind about what songs you want to use or what might be right for the the tempo of that scene um, but if you have songs that you have to use in your film for example my next film has seven live songs so the guy who's writing the songs, I'm having him write everything. Um, I'm lucky he's a Grammy Award winner, but he's, you know, he owns the publishing on everything along with us. So we don't have to worry about then going out and clearing it. Um, there's, it's very complicated because there's a master side and there's a publishing side and you have to clear both sides. Um, and usually for every artist that's on it. So if there's four people in the band, you have to do clearances for four different people. If they perform live, for some reason, it's even more. Um, it's totally different if you're doing it after, um, but you still have to pay. It's. I would get a really good music supervisor, if you can, um, to, who who knows music and know, and can knows the publishing companies and knows the record labels and can clear that. But um, it is something to start thinking about definitely up front. Yeah, and, and yeah, music's always a, is a, is a, is a big challenge, and you you can really find yourself going down the rabbit hole there and get into a lot of trouble. Um, so, I mean, so, I mean, if, I mean, it's, if, if you have friends who have bands, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way to do it. Um, you know, and just, you know, get as many, you know, reach out to like as many people who are, I mean, you know, LA is great. There's a, it's a huge, it's a, I mean, just as big of a film talent as it is, it's a big music town and there's, there's a lot of extraordinary talent and, uh, you know, a, a lot of films you just can't can't afford to to get you know get like the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin or Beatles. I mean, you just, can never afford those. Yeah. So, um, so and then you know and try to get as much original music with your you know find a great com yeah, that's another person in pre pro find a great composer, um, and there's there's a lot of great you know musicians you know coming out of school and stuff like that too, um, but then there's also just as much as there's music clearances there's there's your art clearances. And uh, one thing you can do, though, that, that I've actually found is uh, when you get your production designer on, if your prop person uh, has good relationships, they can actually get you free shit. Um, so I don't know if you can say that, but um, free yeah. stuff. Um, you know, they, 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 have, they can do product placement, you know, so you can get, like, you know, like, you know, Coca-Cola or beer or stuff like that to be, like, you know, set in, you know, in, you know just free, free things. That and it's everything. It's T-shirts. It's... Yeah, art on the wall. I mean, it's like everything, things that you wouldn't even think of. So it's good to have somebody who knows all that. Yeah, I mean, the, the philosophy I always go by is the worst anyone's going to tell me is no. So, I mean, once you figure out the worst, there, no one's going to, like, cuss you out and, like, demean you. Well, that might happen, but it usually won't. The worst they're going to say is no. So there's no harm in asking for this stuff. So like they were saying, you know, Coca-Cola, these beer companies, they want their product out there. Mm -hmm. They want – it's free advertisement for them, basically. They're going to get shown – of course they want to be, you know, part of your project. And another thing that you were saying about the composers and the music supervisor, I have to throw one more shout to Todrick Spalding, who <laughs> is my music supervisor, who handles all my clearances. He does the masters and 
everything is beautiful. But I do have one story where I had to chase down some, um, some drug addicts <laughs> that I needed to have them sign some contracts. And so I had to drive down to Long Beach and try and find them. They were on heroin, so that was very difficult to find. And it was like I almost got shot at that night, but <laughs> I'm still here. That's actually a really good point. If you, know, if you are doing a documentary or something, make sure and get all of your um, releases from anybody who's in it up front because you don't want to be chasing them down when they're on the After the fact, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you really, it, that's, it, it's... Lesson learned. <laughs> Things get a lot more expensive afterwards somehow. You know, like what was, like what would have, someone would have gladly done for, for a free release. Now that your film's in post and, it, and you want that scene, then it's, uh, then, it's, then it's costly. But as far as like art clearances, I mean, try, just try to keep artwork out you know, as much as possible, unless you know the artist. Um, unless it's cleared, and that's the thing with Frederick saying, you can ask, you know, they can always say no, but the thing is you have to ask. You can't just film something with a FedEx truck in the background and think, oh, whatever, you know. I mean, technically though, I mean, it's like, as long as something is used as intended, you know, you're not gonna have problems. I mean, that's the sort of like general rule. So, I mean, you know, you can really technically have Coca-Cola I mean, as far as like what I understand, I'm not an attorney, so I want to do all the disclaimers. But, um, but, uh, but you know, if you're using things as intended, you know, it's it's it shouldn't be a problem. But yeah, but definitely ask. And then like, I mean, but like one for one show that that um, we had, we, we were doing a lot of you know street um, shooting, and and we caught some murals in the background, didn't quite realize it. So afterwards, we had to go find out who the owners of the murals were. And uh, and then like you know then this it was like it was a it was a graffiti uh, just like a street graffiti artist but he had like representation, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he did seriously and then, like and so we had to go this this whole thing it took me like like a month and a half and you know it was it was it was crazy to track him down this guy had, like yeah. graffiti art shows around but yeah but you just have to be very careful like what's what's actually in the frame you you guys don't even know like tattoos now because tattoo artists have become something. You know, have become have made names for themselves. Tattoos are now copywritten. So, if your if your actors have tattoos, you have to alter them in some way or get um, get you know signed off on by the tattoo artist. It's crazy. And there's also script clearance, yes. um, <laughs> which was one of the first things I was thinking of. Uh, at at some at what point in pre-production do you do you do a script? Clarence, and can you explain that process? Um, as soon as as soon as the script is ready, um, it's something that. So essentially, there's there's a, you know there's various attorneys that do it. I think it's like around a thousand bucks is the is the least expensive. And what they do is because you know we're not attorneys. Um, they they will take your script and they'll they'll read it and they'll give you like a you know they'll give you a legal opinion of things to look out for. You know, say like, let's say there's a scene and then it says you have like Gilligan's Island on the TV, you know, on the TV in the background or whatever. And you, and you think that, that you'll, you'll miss that and you'll be like, oh, you know, what am I gonna put on the background? So they'll, they'll actually notate, they, what they do is it'll be like a detailed breakdown of anything that could possibly get you in trouble. And even names. Yeah. Names. Like if, if, you know, there's no other Susan Diners in the world, but somebody names their character Susan Diner, I could sue them. So you need to make sure you get all the names, all your character names cleared. Uh, again, we'll, we'll do questions at the end, sorry. Um, and so the script, the script clearance is important to do. I know on, on very micro budget movies, I've, I've, I've seen people not want to do cl script clearance because it's expensive. But if what you want in the end is distribution, mm -hmm. you have to have it for your errors and emissions insurance, and it will come back to bite you if you didn't plan ahead and get it back when it would actually be helpful, which is in prep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they covered every, they pretty much covered all what you're gonna run into, so yeah. Um, any, uh, oh, permits. I, we did talk about some permits, but Filming permits, location permits in the city of Los Angeles. Any tips? Filmla.com.com.org. Dot dot I can't remember. Filmla. Go to Google and type it in. That is very, 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 very important. I can't stress it more. Say, say you're a city and she's a, a city, or say you're a district and she's a district. I can film there, but she might have a completely different permit situation in her district 
and you could be just across the street from each other. But if I don't get that cleared, I'm getting shut down or, you know, someone's going to complain and that's bad news. So make sure you get your permits done, take care of it early and, you know, follow up on it. Be, they're, they're really quick down at FMLA. So you can call them, you can email them, et cetera, et cetera. It's all online permitting system. Just make sure you get it done. I would actually, I mean, I, I recommend I mean, using a, a permit service um, that, um, like, first of all, like, your location, usually whoever your location manager is should probably have a relationship with a permit service. Um, I mean, I, I mean, like, I've done the point, like, where I go down to film LA, and it, it gets really complicated, especially if you're starting to shoot in other locations around, like, you know, the valley. There's a lot of, like, sub, you know, um, uh, uh, you know like, localities and, and municipalities, and they have different rules and regulations of, like, what time, where, where you can park, if they have a fire officer or a safety officer. And, and um, it, it's really something that, that should be done early with the, cause, like, with the location person, because that's going to really dictate where you're going to shoot because there can be a lot of hidden costs there. You know, if you, if you choose to shoot in, say, Pasadena, um, that's going to be a lot more expensive. They're going to require that you have, like, a fire safety officer, which is going to cost you, like, a thousand bucks a day. They're going to require that you have a police officer, which is, like, another thousand bucks a day. Glendale is also a tough area. You know, there's just a lot of tough areas that, that are, are much more challenging to shoot in. So finding somebody, you know, location manager who has relationships and permit, permit service companies, um, you, and you can look them up on, online, they're, they're not terribly expensive, and I found that they're worth, it's worth the extra know-how. And, and what about some of the, f the incentives for filming at uh, state or city locations? Have you had experience with that? I filmed at Manzanar, which is, I don't know if anyone knows that, it's the former Japanese internment camp up past uh, 15, I believe. And dealing with the state was really easy to get the permits done. It's, it's actually cheap, too. I mean, you can film at Alcatraz for relatively cheap as long as you're not bringing in a full production and you're not shutting it down. So um, get in touch with them early. Re be very nice to them, they, and they, they're going to want to tell you about their national parks and the history and all that stuff. <laughs> just, just listen to them, smile and nod. And some of it's actually really interesting, and some of it's not. But you know, just be nice to these people, and it's actually a really painless process so far from my experience. And actually, the state of California has um, it, it's, uh, you can look up on like one of their websites. Um, they have like the State of California Film Commission has state-owned buildings that that you can shoot at for like really inexpensively, like six hundred bucks a day, and you can get like off. You know, there's like you know off. I mean, there's various restrictions like about when you can shoot and when you can't shoot, but you can get you know great offices for like if, you know five six hundred bucks. Um, I think uh, there's like. Uh, there's a plaza downtown, which is which is part of the the film commission. So they have like, they have like a whole website um, that that's you know shows you these locations. And actually, Film LA has a, a great website of locations too that uh, that are that are pretty pre that's sort of like pre permitted and pre pre cleared to shoot. So a lot of this is doing the research you know online in your yeah, pre pre production. And, and there's location fairs that you can go to, and it's. It's funny because everyone will want you to shoot it there in their place. Like Ventura will tell you how much cheaper it is to shoot their beaches than Malibu, and you know fights break out. It's crazy. <laughs> and to put in like perspective, I know five six hundred dollars sounds really expensive to you guys right now, but to put it in this perspective of what he's talking about, five six hundred dollars is yeah. ridiculously cheap for a day rate on a location. Uh, you can't. I mean, I've had to pay like three thousand dollars for a location a day, and so five hundred dollars, <laughs> I would jump on that immediately. And it's always the extras, I think, that come back to haunt me because even if something is is relatively inexpensive, having the certain personnel that we need there, that can add up. So yeah, I, th I think it, this is another place in prep where if you have someone with the knowledge, a really good location manager um, or line producer who's well-versed in this, who can say, okay, this is this park is not expensive, but the fact that we have to stop traffic over here is very <laughs> expensive, and that involves, you know, a policeman or maybe it involves a fire safety officer, that type of thing. So there are lots of locations is is a complicated part of the budget, and I, I think it's it's very important to have someone who's well versed in that. 
Yeah, because you can get yourself into a lot of trouble, you know, and, and then and it's and that's again that's like why you have more prep time because you can you really have to choose your locations wisely and have somebody who can root out all those hidden costs that you would never even think of because there's there's a lot of them there because it's just it's a very savvy town that's been doing it for you know however eighty years and you know so everyone's everyone's trying to make a buck mm. off of you, <laughs> so. But that said, the police officers I've worked with have been fantastic. They're always very cheerful and helpful and... And they'll work out cash deals. They're great. Yeah. I've, always, <laughs> I've always found that the police officers say that's like their favorite job to get is to work on a film set because they just get paid to eat. Because they yes, always hang you, out with crafty. You make sure that the craft service tray makes it over to yeah. their station. Or they'll, they'll find their way sometimes, but... <laughs> Um, so, okay, the last week of prep, what's going through your, through your mind? Uh-oh, oh, oh shit. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the thing that's going through my mind is everything, and then, of course, the night before you shoot, I can't sleep, and then I, when I do fall asleep, I think I've overslept and that I've missed the, the call time. And then I always think, oh, did that person not get the call sheet? Did, did they not get that? Do they know where the address is? Do we know where the hospital is? Oh, yeah, you got to know where the hospital is, by the way. That's an important thing to know. Um, everything goes through my mind, I say. Yeah, you just wonder if you've done everything that you need to do. I, I do. I mean. I mean, usually I'm just, it's so busy and so crazy that, that you're just, at that point, you're just, you know, you're, you're hoping everything's in place and you're acting and, you know, nine times out of ten, you're actually replacing like a lost location or something else. So, or or or, or an actor. actor like dropped off, and you have to like get a new actor. So, I mean, there's, you know, there, you just you just have to be prepared. You know, if that there's something, anything that can go wrong will probably go wrong. And then just you know, just don't stress it out. Just deal with like one thing at a time because you know, and just to expect it. You know. And sometimes your actor gets a DUI the week before you shoot, <laughs> and yeah, that happens. But that kind of goes back to your initial thing that you said is being prepared and, and pre-production is so important because everything will go wrong. I mean, it just always does. And you will lose locations and you very well could lose actors. So if, you're, if you've planned well, then you're not going to panic. And that's one thing I always tell like my, my production teams like when I is, um, is uh, in that last week and like when you're you know, just like all through pre-pro is and you know, like as like when you guys are producers, is that the actual producers have to be the best actors on set because <laughs> because like literally you, it's everything's on fire, mm -hmm. you know. So I mean, even like no matter what preparation you know that that you do, it's it's not just your shoot that's on fire. Like every shoot's on fire, so it's okay. So you just have to pretend like it's not. You just have to keep trudging through it calmly because you set the tone for the rest of the shoot. So if you're calm and then and you have it all together and your mind's going crazy, it's okay, you know. Yeah, inevitably the makeup artist will sleep with the grip and that will cause an issue. So <laughs> it's like clockwork, it happens all the time for some reason. The grip, it's usually the actor. I found it's the grip for some reason, but that actually happened where it was the actor and like that was a whole total chaos that happened there. Um, just make sure the sound guy turns off the mics between takes. <laughs> and make sure they turn it on sometimes too. <laughs> Sometimes you'll have a whole scene shot and like, oh, but we didn't get any sound on that. Well, I, I think we can start with a few questions, um, and, which, and you guys keep adding in any topics you want to explore more. Um, first off, for the whole panel, anyone who wants to respond, please talk more about acquiring insurance. Sure. Um, so for insurance, insurance can definitely be be expensive, um, but it's it, but it's it's a critical aspect. Um, you know, there, there's there's only a few insurance companies and brokers out there. Um, if you're if you're lucky enough, you have like a um, there's there's two types of insurance. There's like you can get a, an annual policy, a year long policy, or a couple of companies still have short term policies. Um, so you can just go directly to the insurance brokers and and try to get the best deal. Um, the second way is like if you have like a friend who has a company or another friend who shot a feature and they still have their insurance policy. I mean, you can, you know, you can you can hire them as a company. But there's also production service companies, and that's that's a great way to go if you have like a, a low budget. Is um, you can you can hire a company that actually has an insurance uh, a certificate, insurance policy, and you can work out a deal with them. 
Yeah, insurance is extremely important. Uh, these rental houses won't rent anything to you without insurance. So, and also keep in mind that there's different insurances depending on what you're doing. Like, there's a different type of insurance for when the equipment gets into the grip truck and starts moving than when the grip truck is stationary. So that's a completely different insurance for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, it's, and um, the houses make sure that you have it and they won't let anything leave their house until your insurance is taken care of. Also, you can't employ <laughs> actors or other artists without workers comp. Yes, and then and so that also goes into um, you know insurance and workers comp and uh, and payroll all kind of goes together. Um, I mean, for me, I can on, on the indies that I've done, I've I've all, I mean I always you know, like legally legally you're required to 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 go through payroll and to you know, but to get like payroll and to get workers comp you know you have to have insurance um, you know they they just won't do it without it. Um, I mean, I know there are productions that are done with without, um, you know, that, that, that do do have whatever deals that they do. But, uh, you know, for me, it's like it's like an inexpensive. Like if you if you have an investor, you know, it's like in in, in it's just a legal liability that's just going to protect you down the road. Um, but you can also go straight to um, the state has like a workers comp fund, and you can go straight to workers' comp. And for those of you who don't know what, who workers comp, what workers' comp is, it's, a, it's an insurance policy that's, that's legally required by the state of California that covers anybody who gets injured. And, you know, and that and almost someone always gets like either bee sting or, you know, something happens on set, you know, someone you know, bumps their head and they have to go to the doctor. Um, uh, you know, you want to you want to have this you, know, you want to have this protection. And the nice thing about having um, a payroll company do it is, if you hire if you have a payroll company, the payroll company, not your not your company, but the payroll company, is the employer of record for the state of California. So any sort of like you know like injuries, you know like minor injuries or God forbid major injuries, you know it's not it's not you're shielded and your company is shielded because it's being they're being paid through payroll. So it's it's you know it's it's it, you know it adds on twenty percent to everyone's rate, um, you know. So if you're paying someone a hundred bucks, you know it's you know it ends up being like a hundred and twenty-two. But but as as far as like a, a, you know it's it just it, it just it saves you um, for anything. Not only that, is you got to think it's better to spend a couple thousand now than to spend tens and tens of thousands later. So that's the and to hold up your film. Yeah. Yeah, and and payroll. Um, the payroll company will do all the fringes for states, mm -hmm. for the, the state, city, unions, guilds, and all that is well worth the price. And there, and there are companies that actually will run your payroll for you and do, do your insurance for you. So you can, you can uh, just do that, you know, and it's always like one shop deal, you know, one, 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 yeah, one stop shopping. Uh, here's here's a question close to all of our hearts. I think um, if a movie takes two to three years to make, how do you pay your rent during that time? <laughs> <laughs> do you get paid for three years? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, get a day job, do whatever it takes. I'm, it's you know, I the movie that I just produced, I still haven't gotten paid on yet, and it's out in theaters. Um, that happens sometimes because as a producer, oftentimes you have to defer your payment. Um, just that's the nature of indie filmmaking right now. It's, it's, it's become, it's become difficult, but there's also, you know, it's kind of the wild west right now with so many distribution outlets and so much new stuff happening. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? But right now it is very hard to make a living just making indie films. Side projects, definitely side projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just as far as I like gain gain the whole film process, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 I first did a short film and when I first came out to LA and like won a bunch of awards and, you know, then I, I had my feature script in hand and I went all over and I thought I was like, you know, be this big shot producer and, uh, and uh, you know, and I had a lot of money saved up and, nothing happened, you know, so I was like, you know, I was pounding the pavement, and then, so I, I had to, uh, you know, even though I had, you know, been producing, I had to, like, 
you know, in, in New York and stuff, I had to come here, I had to start paying and start over because I had to find a way to pay rent. And there's, you know, it takes a while to get a film off the ground. So you, you have to have like a viable means of, of making money and survival. And, uh, and then, you know, for me, I was lucky I was able to do, do commercials. Yes, I think we've all been there. <laughs> I mean, there, there are different, uh, there are jobs in the industry, I think, as, as Frederick's hinting at, I think the side projects, projects that use producer type tool set skills. I've done boom work on a reality show, so that was, that paid well, actually. It was really easy, too. So. <laughs> You're Looking tall. That. I mean, I sometimes do consulting. I, you know, you kind of just have to do whatever it takes, hopefully, to make your, till you make your next film. Okay, next question. Um, what is the one element of pre-production that should be obvious, but everyone forgets? I think we're all forgetting now, huh? Yeah. Uh, I, I thought of something actually that I would love to hear your thoughts on. Cash flow. We didn't really talk about it specifically. You know, you talk about when the money's hitting the bank, but um, I always think, oh, I just signed my agreements, we're financed, we're ready to go, and then I really need to make sure that my accountant, because I'm not the person to do it, has has a calendar for how much money we need and when. Yeah, that, I mean, the cash flow is, is it's, it's really, can be, um, it's, it's really, ch it can be challenging and that's, that's all part of like the, the, the pre-production is, um, is, is you, the, there's, you could essentially get hit with like a bottleneck, like kind of up front. Um, like, like when you're about, you know, a few weeks out because you have, when anytime you're renting equipment, you know, like with SAG, you have to do a deposit. Um, so you have to put all these deposits down, you have to put deposits down on gear. So, you know, you have all this money that, you know, so you think you have like, okay, I have like, you know, it's going to cost me $1,000 to do this, but it's really going to cost, you have to have $10,000 worth of reserve before you, you know, to, to, to cover all these, all these deposits, which don't come back to you until afterwards. So a lot of times your, your, your post money is, is doubling for your cash flow. Um, so, but, but you do have to plan that out and, and then whoever's doing your schedule and your budget, you know, like the, that's where the accountant comes in and that's why it's so important because they need to be, keep you on track of like when, when like which, you know, it's, it's, it's a weekly sort of cash flow. It's like, you know, how much am I going to be spending each week? Craft services. I think that's one that sometimes gets forgotten about and you don't realize how important it is until your crew is hungry and you got to make sure, especially now there's a lot of dietary restrictions on set. So that's another thing you should make sure you get taken care of. Make sure you know what your crews, some people may be gluten free, some people may be vegan, some people may be vegetarians. So make sure you've got all that information taken care of, especially with your actors. So make sure that's all logged away and just make sure that you pay your craft services person and make sure that they're happy. Because if they're happy, then everyone else is happy. And finding someone who can do all the paperwork for you, because there's a lot of paperwork, you know, like, and finding, like, a good coordinator, because that's, you know, there's, like, there's, I mean, that's always, you know, like, everyone, I, I mean, it's, it's communicating all this information to all the different departments, um, it can get pretty hairy. So you really want someone who's good at, uh, at organizing and, and, and sending stuff out and keeping people informed. Yes. My shout out to Wendy, the fabulous production coordinator for my last <laughs> film. Um, and one more question. If, if you guys have questions, pass them to Dennis because we, we have a little bit of time. I have one more here. Um, do you need a release from a real life person that a screenplay is based upon? Yes. <laughs> Would you like to elaborate? <laughs> I mean, you should get the life rights if, if the screenplay is based on somebody and you have to secure that. I mean, before anything, you can't make a you can't you can't make a film if you don't have the life rights from somebody unless they have been dead over a hundred years. Is it seventy? Unless they're in public domain, or unless they're like a big name person, in which case they're public domain. But I mean, if it's like, you know, I know this person who had cancer, and I'm going to base this on what happened during their life story, then yeah. For example, my last film, Free Ride, the one that's out now. 
the writer director Shauna, she wrote it based on her life story, but she still had to get life rights from her mom and from her sister, and from herself. <laughs> and and it's and it is better, like, even if they are celebrities. It is if you can yeah. get their get their rights. Um, that that's that's pretty critical. I mean, unless you're making a parody. You know. And if it's like a, a biography um, about a public figure, if you can get the rights to the book then studios or whomever you go to make it with, they're going to be far more likely to, to be happy, to, you know, to make the film because if nobody sued them over the book, then they're less likely to sue you over the movie. So uh, it just, it's just that layer of confidence that you won't be sued. <laughs> I haven't had to deal with that yet, but I agree with everything they said. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I think that goes back to uh, getting... Uh, life rights, or if you're doing documentaries, appearance releases for anybody, anybody who does interviews. And um, I know in crowd scenes, I've done those placards. Have you yeah. guys done that? Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about that process? Uh, uh, if, you do a doc if you do a documentary and you're filming at a public place, you can have a sign when everybody enters that says, this is being filmed by entering. You are giving us permission to film your likeness blah, 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 blah. And if you film that, you know, and then film people going in, you're, you're pretty much set because they know it. And you should post it a lot of places where people can see. And if possible, if it's like a concert or something like that, somebody can make an announcement at the beginning and let everybody know that they're being filmed. Um, I've also seen like a bunch of smaller places where in order to enter, you have to sign a release form. So it depends on if you're at a bigger venue or a smaller venue. But you can also do verbal releases where if, if you want to get somebody on camera just saying, hi, my name is so-and-so, I give you permission to film me for this show, and there you go. And that's fine, too. That's legally binding. But definitely you have to take a picture of the placard um, that, that actually that, that, that provides proof of the locale. So like, and it has like, you know, like it, it, it'll show like a, in the, you, know, you do like the tight on the, on the, you take two pictures almost like the tight on the actual placard and then you do like a little bit wider that shows it in the environment. Then maybe that show like the, the street crossing sign or whatever so you can prove that you had this up, you know, on that day. Uh, I saw another film that was a Tribeca Film Festival that was, they had a, this brilliant idea, they shot it on the subways and they had a whiteboard, you know, that, that essentially they, they, had, they had the release and they and they um, they just had it had it there, and they just had the whiteboard. So they just wrote the person's name, and they just put them on camera really quickly before they shot them. And then um, and then they just went on to the next person, and they just you know kept all the legal stuff, and they just erased it, wrote the new person's name on it with a sharpie, and then they filmed that really quick, and it was like two seconds done. And if you if you get you know, listen, if you get people that think that they're going to be in your movie, if you can get them to sign to give their email address so you can start your mailing list. It's really great because then you're starting your own marketing campaign in a sense because you've got all these people that think that they may be in the movie. They've got a shot at being in the movie. So they're going to tell all their friends to watch the movie. So you want to keep them informed as much as you can about what's going on with your film. Yes, capture information yes. at any point in the journey. <laughs> so we have a couple more questions. Um, in your experience of working with actor producers, what is your advice on keeping these hats separate? And what are the pitfalls of trying to take on too large a role in multiple parts of the process? I, I, I think it's, it's people who are actor producers and, and trying to do too much. Um, I've dealt with director actors. I haven't dealt with actor producers yet. My last film, um, Anna Paquin starred in, and because she, you know, came in and was so gracious to star in this very, very indie film, um, she became a producer on it, and she was great. She let us take the lead. Um, she wanted to learn as much as possible, and I think um, if you are, you know, an actor producing for the first time, watch and learn as much as you can, t and ask questions, you know? But I would say sit back and, and let the people that have been doing it for a while take the lead and um, learn as much as you can. And, uh, and definitely find the right partner. 
Um, I mean, the TV show that I did, um, the actors and uh, were the writers, they were the producers, the director was the producer. And uh, the, we, they, I mean, everyone really used it wisely to make smart decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, you know, use it, use it to your advantage, you know, because um, you have then as actor producer, then you have the control to make the decisions that's going to, you know, share your, share your story. And, uh, and yeah, just cho choose the right person who can, who can take up all those things that, that complement you. And don't be afraid to ask questions either. I mean, that's, that's a very important thing. It's, I know we're all like worried about looking dumb or stupid, but you're going to look dumber or stu uh, by, not ask, yeah, by not asking the question. And then when we come to look for you, so, oh, did you take care of that? Oh, what was I supposed to take care of? Yeah, it's better just to ask. I mean, we're all dumb in our own way. <laughs> We're all learning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've done probably over a hundred like commercials, and uh, every one, every single one, I've learned something new on, and uh, and haven't been afraid to ask like what I don't know. So. I think that's what I love about this business and producing in, in general, and because every experience is different, and there's heartache and there's celebration, but every step along the way, I feel like I learn something new. So I think we have one more question here. Is a hundred thousand dollar budget enough to do an indie feature, especially out of state, like Oklahoma? <laughs> yes. <laughs> my, I, I made a film for my first film was twenty thousand uh, dollars. My second film was thirty thousand dollars, and that was shot in Wisconsin. My first one was shot in Los Angeles County. I mean, and again, it depends on the script and and what it entails. If it's a giant action film with major chase scenes, then probably not. But if it's like a few people in a room, with five rooms sitting around, you know, if it's if it's more character driven, then certainly, um, I think you can you can make anything happen if if it's the right project. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's I mean, a hundred thousand you can do you can do a lot with, and it's just a matter of getting the right team and the right support. I mean, you know, twenty thousand you can you you can make magic happen if if you have the like if you're if you're smart about it, and uh, and I encourage people to 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 go for it at any budget level. It's just a matter of getting the right people involved who can help you make that happen. I, I, she actually makes me want to go on this rant right now. Uh, write to your budget, please. Write to the budget. If you know that you only have X amount of dollars, don't include like this elaborate mall shot with you know gunshots and car chases like she was saying. Please don't do that. My my friend just recently shot his film for eight thousand dollars, and he knew what his budget was, and so he it was just you know he and his friends walking around their local city, walking and talking, you know riding bikes. That that's what's smart. You know don't overwrite for your budget. Is basically what I'm saying. And on that note, <laughs> no, I, I think any film can be done for any amount of money, and it, it's it's all the bells and whistles in between. So, you got to find the right team to help put it together. Um, but thank you all so much for your wisdom, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> can we take a photo for social media? We have to promote ourselves, right? Uh, yeah, I think, I think Dennis, Dennis can help us out with that. And thank you guys, and good luck with all your projects. I ask that question every day. <laughs>